Okay, so welcome to this topic on globalisation, consumerism and inequality, or how inequality makes us all scared, sad and anxious, or in some of the things I'll be looking at, that we looked at early in the course, like sick and or dead. So the, we do, again, we'll do this in three parts, and I'm going to begin with just talking you know, very, very broadly about global inequality. To begin with, I think a kind of question around class and inequality that sociology grapples with is what to do about it in terms of how to analyse it. Most sociological works have been about class within nation states. Mm -hmm. It's been a thing, particularly in the last 20 years, 30 years, that it's increasingly been critiqued. Beck talks about methodological nationalism, that we need to kind of move beyond thinking about these things within our countries and talk about how these things interrelate. And much of our course has been looking at yeah. you know, kind of, you know, everyday, almost mundane aspects of these kind of relations. By pointing to all the global inequalities here, again, I don't want to downplay the importance of inequalities within nations. So I've just got a couple of links there to kind of think about that. One of which I think is interesting about, like, you know, in terms of the relation between consumption and technology is air, something like air conditioning. Mm -hmm. We've increasingly realised that poor people in Australia subsidise, you know, middle class and richer people when it comes to air conditioning. Why? Because um, the infrastructure needs support. Most of our bill is about the infrastructure, not the consumption, and, you know, um, people are are paying the same rate regardless mm -hmm. of how much they consume. So it's one interesting way to think about how technology and consumption relates to inequalities there. And there's another kind of four corners episode about like, you know, what it's like to experience poverty in Australia. So I just thought I'd put them in there for those interested in that to think about inequalities within a nation state. But what we're interested in this course is more global relations. And um, again, just a kind of quick an interesting illustration of those kind of things is Danny Dorling's work, a really important and well-known, uh, I think he's more of a human geographer, yeah. uh, about um, about inequalities, uh, both class within nations, but particularly in, in his more recent work, um, Global Inequalities. And what he's got is this world mapper project, this website where he uses the map of the world, then kind of... Um, inserts statistics into each country that kind of distorts the way mm. countries look to represent different kinds of inequalities and there's kind of a version of that there. So you can look at um, examples of that on the website and there's also a, um, a YouTube, uh, I think, uh, him talking about it. So they're good ways to get kind of your head around some of the things we're going to talk about more generally. So in terms of the human consequences of this stuff, we've looked already, I think, uh, introduced ideas of gore capitalism and necropolitics earlier in the course. And we've looked at the physical aspects of, and waste of the mm -hmm. systems. Um, what we're going to talk about here is kind of what um, Bauman has referred to as the wasted lives, the kind of way that humans are kind of wasted um, in many of these processes. So much of the analysis here talks about, like, development, mm -hmm. um, but kind of points out that, you know, it's the West that benefits from the exploitation and many of the things we've looked at throughout the course already about that, and that for many, you know, people's lives haven't moved beyond that kind of state of nature thing that Thomas Hobbes was talking about centuries ago. Life is kind of poor, brutish, nasty and short. You can see this expressed in levels of um, um, life, ex life expectancy mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, it's you know, 78, 80 for men in the, in the West and it's kind of much less than that in many other places around the world. From a sociological perspective then, when we think about this on a global level, you know, what does this mean when we talk about terms like civilization and progress, these things we take for granted, if therefore our own, um, you know, civilization and progress is based on the exploitation and, um, and, you know, death and sickness of many other people around the world. So this is the kind of large scale global relations that we're looking at in this. Intrinsic to this is the understanding of how violence works. Yeah. Most of us think about violence in terms of the physical, you know, punching someone, you know, rape, domestic violence, murder, wars. This is kind of what we see as real violence. Mm -hmm. Really, though, this is kind of one aspect of violence. It's obviously a horrible version of it, but there's symbolic and systemic understandings of violence as well that kind of are important to, I suppose, understand how that physical violence and almost the acceptance of it in the way that we produce and consume things is supported. Mm -hmm. So there's symbolic violence... Uh, Pierre Bourdieu in particular, interested here about the way that language itself uh, conveys and supports, you know, violent relations. Mm -hmm. We can think about this just in the very idea of development. Mm -hmm. um, first world, second world, third world, why these kind of, are kind of almost 
ethnocentric rankings of what's going on, developed, developing, you know, developing to what? If we're developed and we're all unhappy and anxious and bored and cynical, mm. how developed are we? Um, even in uh, the example I used to explain the symbolic violence version of it is like in a country like Australia, we use the word like ethnic to refer to minorities. We're really ethnic's just meant to be a category of kind mm. of different cultures and, and traditions or whatever, but we always seem to use it and invert it as a way of talking about minorities. So mm. these kind of symbolically violent relations, again, are some of the things that support uh, these wider kind of more physical violent things. And systemic violence, really, then, is a way of thinking about how the very system itself, as kind of the way our economic systems work, produces these relations. Mm. Um, in that way, in the sense you've been talking about them as entanglements throughout the yeah. course, um, our economic, economic system really is a key way of operating. And it feels like many of these relations are blameless in a way. Yes. They just kind of happen. And, and they're naturalised. And that's, yeah. what, the, yeah. that's where the violence is so insidious because it's masked by natural forms of yeah. language. If we take even something really basic like petrol and oil yep. and the, the need for, for petrol around the world how it affects everything from food price yep. uh, to uh, the availability of byproducts to the availability of, of, of food and other commodities, how it makes infrastructure flow and work, etc., etc., etc. And it affects the way that governments spend money, massive amounts on like military spending to kind of you know get access and to securitize oil, as opposed to say you know spending things on hospitals and education systems. And in a lot of poor countries, governments subsidise oil to keep its costs for consumers low, but then run up big debts in that case, which leads to a lot of political pressure. So the systemic violence caused by this commodity that has become so essential and around which all economies are sort of organised, despite the fact that it's depleting and will soon run out, gives a really good, I think, example of those that interplay between there are places where that manifests as physical violence, armed conflicts and and wars, symbolic violence in the fact that this is seen to be kind of a natural outcome of, of development processes, but also how tied it is to colonial um, mm. violence and, and um, yeah. mercantilism, and then also how systemic this is. We're stuck in this system, and it's not just like everyone's stuck in this yeah. system. You know, Oil matters as much in Equatorial Guinea's economy as it does in Australia's economy yeah. too, so it's a, very, um, it's a really good way, I think, to bear out these consequences. Mm. That's right. So with, that's, I'll get to kind of violence again later in, the, in the, one of the other parts. Um, again, I think we've t- I've, taken, I've critiqued kind of economic understandings and statistics of this. Um, you know, it's it's quite easy to represent these systemic kind of horrible relations in stats. And we hear it so much mm-hmm. all the time now. It's just like a just people just kind of can rattle it off and mm-hmm. like I even know this, but still like it continues. So I've got this is quite a dated version of it now. But you know, the poorest 1.2 billion, one fifth of the world's population are only responsible for 1.3% of the world's consumption, 4% of its energy supplies, and 1.5% of all telephone connections. So, um, you know, the 900 million people privileged by the grace of birth in the West are responsible for 86% of the world's consumption, 58% of its energy supplies, 79% of world income, and, you know, etc. So, um, statistics well express the unequal relations but again as when i was talking about things earlier about like things like gdp they don't really kind of mm. convey the human cost and they They're also kind of figures on a paper and we can just kind of go oh yeah that's unfair and they throw us into what are somewhat unhelpful dichotomies west and non-west you know whereas a lot of the non-west have very privileged people who keep people in states of poverty yeah. for their own consumption and of course there's a lot of poverty yeah. in the west yeah. The UK is a pretty good example at the moment. It's going through such an extreme level of poverty that food banks are becoming such a necessity. Yep. Um, even employed people need to depend upon yep. kinds of welfare. So I think it's always good to problematise anything that gives us a sense mm. that there's a mass scale to inequality. I think that's a good level to start with, but then you've got to go deeper and yeah. deeper and deeper and look within. And I think almost politically, I think that we need qualitative subjective like descriptions of what this means for the actual people on the ground to yes. actually have effects on maybe influencing people to change the way we practice or something that yes. the it seems like the stats that express things don't seem to ever engender any change we know them we yeah. know they were getting worse like you know it was like five years ago eight people i think had like 50% of the world's mm. wealth or something like and now it's four it's like all these kind of but we know where they're going we know that the um, CO2 in the atmosphere is still getting more and more despite mm. all the stuff like 
they don't seem to be actually making much, that much different to practice. I think that's a good point too, because they then become so naturalised that we accept mm. that. Oh, you know, the proportion of the population in this part of the world has this much of the wealth and and, and doesn't you know contribute yeah. so much of the pollution and waste, and this, and then we get so used to it that we just go, well, of course, you know, yeah. what do you expect? That's how that's how poverty and wealth function, which of yeah. course is untrue. Um, so I think this, is, this leads it nicely into the problem of stacks. Yeah, and I might go into this too much detail, but just generally, you know, I've, I spoke a little bit already, I think, about how average figures distort reality. So I don't know if the average wage in Australia, for instance, is like $75,000, really the median is like fifty five, right? Mm. because the, the upper end drags it up and it's not really good description of what's going on. And so this is also the case then if you look at, you know, relative figures around the world. Um, secondly, like when it comes to stats... It doesn't relate to how people feel. Mm. Um, and, you know, as much interesting sociological work has shown that, like, um, you know, we don't measure happiness mm. or maybe these things are hard to measure and um, there are kind of efforts to do that. But really, like, you know, rendering, like, GDP or someone's, um, you know, worth or whatever is one thing, but really it doesn't necessarily relate to whether they're having a good life or they're happy or satisfied. So I think um, that's important. I'll talk a little bit about that further on. Um most importantly, I think that, yeah, as we've kind of already said, the figures kind of hide the true human consequences. Balance sheets, these kind of things don't really express the exploitation, violence and contamination and the waste and all that kind of stuff that we've looked at. Um, it doesn't really point to the kind of what sociologists have started to call these human costs or wasted lives and, and that kind of thing. So to sum up in relation to other parts, of course, statistics hide mm. the necropolitics and gore capitalism. They don't represent really what's happening in terms of what it means to be humans in this system. Mm. Importantly here, when we think about class, is that, like, you know, again, the, the Warren Buffett quote here, if there's a class war, his class is winning, you know, the billionaires are winning. Um, this is kind of an increasingly obvious transnational capitalist class that is largely dominated by white people in the West, but does include people from, you know, the so-called developing world that become part of this. And they, you know, mix in the same circles, they have the same exclusive clubs, they stay in the same ridiculously expensive hotels. They're increasingly building fortified places to live in to wall themselves off from the, um, you know, the problems that the, this kind of very form of inequality is creating. So uh, Leslie Sclair is the kind of key person that kind of developed this idea. Um, again, there's in, um, some kind of different levels of the, the transnational capitalist class there. But it's importantly here when we're thinking about class and inequality that we just don't look at those at the bottom of the system mm -hmm. and think about, you know, that the problems of that. It's also, you know, privilege is very much part of this and very much how these things continue to operate. So I, I put this in here again, a really dated reference, mm -hmm. 1995, from a book called The Global Trap. But this is an anecdote that I think kind of speaks to what the problem is here. Um, and particularly in terms of the way our leaders, elites, that transnational class, but also, you know, the politicians that serve them, um, think about the problems and think about the people that are on the pointy end of it. So there was this kind of global economic summit, I think in the late 90s, where it was attended by a bunch of important politicians, important business people. Um, and they started to have a serious discussion about, you know, inequalities rising, um, huge problems at the time in Africa with food and, you know, approaching oil, um, peak oil and all this kind of thing. So they kind of saw that there's, there's bad things coming here, you know, and many civilizations as they get more and more unequal have broken down in the past. So there was these discussions about what to do about it. There was a serious discussion done by these people about what they should, maybe we should provide what they called tittytainment very much like bread of circuses, just enough entertainment, just enough nourishment to keep the 80% that are largely left out going so they don't, you know, revolt and, you know, attack the 20%. This isn't some kind of science fiction movie. It's actually a discussion that took place at an international summit. Very much, I think, um, a kind of saying the quiet part loud that mm. happens very rarely and that happens increasingly rarely today. So... I think, again, this is a kind of good encapsulation of class relations and how things are going. Um, inequality is increasing. Um, you can see these kind of problems all around the world um, increasing in terms of waste and um, climate change and stuff like that. There has to be something at some stage that happens. Um, many of us, maybe from my point of view, are quite cynical whether things are going to change until too late. Um, and certainly if we kind of adopt 
these kind of orientations towards inequality, I think, you know, large scale civilization issues are going to be an actual thing that we're going to have to deal with. With class, do you see uh, you know, globally in many parts of the world, especially the developing world, the middle class is growing, however defined, on mass. So the, the kind of upper end and the lower end are, are, are also moving, in a sense, because mm. the middle class is, is growing. Is the middle class shrinking in places like Yeah, Australia? sometimes it's getting hollowed out, right? Mm. So um, it's, an incre- it's an interesting kind of comparison. Um, I mean, you see figures, for instance, that like less people than ever before are living off a dollar a day, and that, mm. that's often kind of pointed out as a kind of, I suppose, an example of how the trickle-down effect works. But you see in places like Australia that in many cases the middle class has been hollowed out. They're less secure. They're earning kind of less comparative money. Mm. They don't have full-time work and all this kind of thing. And this kind of very much speaks, I think, to stuff I'll talk about in the last part of the lecture about satisfaction and happiness. Mm. About um, Even to me, people or countries that seem to be doing well out of globalisation, their populations don't seem very happy. Mm. Okay, I'll leave it there. <laughs>